Honorable Dr. Iskandar bin Yahya and Associate Prof Professor I.R. Dr. Nohana bin Asad, Counselor of both IEEE EDS UKM Student Branch Chapter and IEEE UKM Student Branch, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to welcome you to all this virtual distinguished lecture with the topic of nanomems, enabling the Internet of Things. My name is Chua Wei Xiong and I'm the moderator for today's session. Before we start, let me explain how you can talk to us during the session. If you, have, if you have any question during the presentation, just write them down in the meeting chat. We will have a, a Q&A session at the end of the presentation to answer your question. Alternatively, you are also allowed to unmute your microphone to ask your question during the Q&A session. Now, I would like to introduce the presenter today, his doctor, Hector J. De Los Santos. Dr. J. Dr. Hector J. De Los Santos received his PhD in electrical engineering from Purdue University, West Lafayette. In 1989, he found Nanomems Research, a company engaged in nano electrical, electromechanical quantum circuit and system, MEMX and RF means, research consulting and education, where he focus, focuses on discovering fundamentally new device circuit and design techniques. From 2001 and two, to 2003, he lectured the worldwide as an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer of the Microwave Theory and Technique Society. Since 2006, he has been an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer from the Electron Device Society. In February 2020, he was bestowed upon the title of Honorary Professor of MIT by MIT University, Noida. He is now an IEEE Fellow. Okay, all right. Without any further ado, I would like to welcome the presenter, Dr. Hector J. De Los Santos. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. The floor is yours. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, doctor. Okay, good morning and thank you very much for the invitation to give this presentation. Uh, I have never been to Malaysia, but uh, at least this gives me an opportunity to reach that community. So my name is Hector de los Santos and the title of my presentation is Nanomems Enabling the Internet of Things. The outline of the presentation is as shown. I will begin by describing the genesis of the Internet of Things and its motivation and impact. Then I will briefly introduce the nanomems field, in particular its origins, fabrication principles, and some device physics and applications. Then I will present a couple of examples of how nanomems enables the Internet of Things in the area of low power consumption radios 
and energy harvesting, and then I will conclude. The Internet of Things. What is it? The Internet of Things connects devices such as everyday consumer objects and industrial equipment onto the network, enabling information gathering and management of these devices via software to increase efficiency, enable new services, or achieve other health, safety, or environmental benefits. This definition was given by Kevin Ashton, a British technologist in 1989 when he was at MIT. A more recent definition of the Internet of Things is that it refers to a network of smart devices communicating and exchanging data with other machines, objects, devices, and the environment around the globe. The IoT was defined as having been born between the years 2008 and 2009, when the number of connected devices became greater than the number of people in the Earth. The IoT may be viewed as a network of networks where we have individual networks connected together within a system endowed with security, analytics, and management. When the point of having more objects connected to the internet than people was reached, a huge amount, a, I mean, a huge window of opportunity opened up for the creation of applications in the areas of automation, sensing, and machine-to-machine -machine communications. The IoT has an enormous breadth. Therefore, it can be difficult to understand or comprehend. To facilitate its understanding, the IoT has been broken into five categories, namely connected wearable devices, connected wearable, uh, connected cars, connected homes, connected cities, and the industrial internet. The number of internet of things devices connected worldwide has had a continuous growth. For example, in 2020, it was about 8.74 billion devices, and this is expected to grow to about 25.4 billion devices by the year 2030. A wide variety of sensors will make the Internet of Things possible. These are typified by microphones, gyroscopes, accelerometers, pressure and magnetic sensors, which may be attached to mobile devices. Bosch is a typical company that is hard at work on this vision. The main drivers for consumer electronics include motion detection, pedestrian navigation, position detection, and user interfaces. Hewlett Packard has proposed the so-called central nervous system of the earth vision, which entertains the fusion of machine 
with man, virtual and physical systems to revolutionize human interaction with the earth as profoundly as the internet has revolutionized personal and business interactions. To achieve this full connectivity all over the world, it is expected that of the order of 1 trillion nanoscale sensors and actuators will be needed, as well as the equivalent of 1,000 internets. The bottom line is that the Internet of Things is driven by huge economic impact on the world economy. The number of the of IoT connections is expected to grow to 25 billion by 2025. And this in turn is leading to what is expected to lead to productivity benefits, which will be worth over $370 billion per year in 2025, or one third of the global gross domestic product. Let me now go on to briefly introduce the field of nanomems. It can be said that the field of nanomems was originated by Feynman back in 1959 when he made the observation there is plenty of room at the bottom. Feynman reached this conclusion upon conducting a special type of search, namely a search for a boundless field. He noticed that fields like endeavoring to attain low temperatures or attaining high pressures had virtually no end in sight, in the sense that you could never say or claim that you had reached the lowest temperature or the highest pressure. The field that he came up with was that of miniaturization, whose goal was to engage in a program to make everything small. But why had so little been done on miniaturization? I'm wonder. Were there innate or fundamental limitations imposed by the laws of physics? No, he concluded. There is nothing in the laws of physics that precludes miniaturization. What does preclude, preclude miniaturization is technology, that is our ability to make small things, not physics. Hello, doctor. Yes. So, sorry for interrupt. Uh, can you please uh, click the hide button, the below one? No, 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 the Google Meet one. Oh, this one? Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> so having acknowledged that the limitations to miniaturization were rooted in our, our ability to make small things, that is on technology, Feynman went on to consider what would be the impacts of miniaturization in information storage and computers. And in these areas, he found out that great gains would be attained because The only thing that need to, needed to be done was uh, downscaling. So by, the, by downscaling, you would improve the performance of information storage and computers. The third area he considered was machinery, <clears throat> uh, which is related to our area of, of, of nanomems. And in this area, he determined that new design paradigms would have to be developed because machines would not simply could not simply be scaled down and work properly. But new domains of material behavior would be found. And grappling with this new domain of material behavior to design 
downscale machines would give rise to fundamental paradigm shifts in all areas of science and technology. That means that there will be virtually an unlimited amount of application in the area of machinery. Now, what do we mean by small? An examination of the machines in operation finds that uh, on the one hand, we have conventional machines occupying dimensions from millimeters to kilometers. On the other hand, we have molecular machines or biological machines synthesized by chemists in the area of around nanometers. In between, there, is, there was a big a, a gap The combination of these two, machines at the nanoscale and machines in the area of around microns, gives rise to nanomems. Now, the, the field lay dormant until our ability to make small things improved. And this occurred in the 1960s with the advent of integrated circuit fabrication technology. Since circuits could be scaled down and still perform their function, a race ensued to develop ways to print more and more circuits on a given subset of a wafer. On the economic side, this was beneficial because the greater the number of circuits that could be printed in a given area, the greater were the profits. An index of the progress in miniaturization is gauged by the integration level or the number of devices per chip. This number was less than 10 in the 1960s and increased to more than 1 billion by the year 2000. Now, the economic success of the IC industry led people to wonder what would the application of IC fabrication concepts in other fields like mechanics, optics, and fluidics, uh, would that application re result in enhanced performance and reduce cost? And the answer was yes, maybe. Because an IC, as we know, extends in two dimensions, but a mechanical structure is three-dimensional in nature. Therefore, techniques had to be developed for microstructure generation, which would allow the third dimension of a structure to be shaped. To see how nanomems is motivated by these fabrication techniques, I will briefly review them. Next. Most of us are familiar with the conventional two dimensional. IC fabrication process, which is based on photolithography and chemical etching, and is predicated upon the following fundamental steps. The wafer is covered with a barrier, typically silicon dioxide for a silicon wafer. The surface is then coated with a light sensitive material called a photoresist. A photo mask plate, which is a square uh, is a square glass plate with a patterned emulsion or metal film on one side is placed over the wafer, and the photoresist is exposed through the mask to high intensity ultraviolet light, whatever the mask is transparent. The system is then, or the wafer is then subjected to a process similar to that for developing photographic film. And the result depends on the nature of the photoresist. If a photoresist is positive, 
<clears throat> when the UV light goes through the mask and is developed, one ends up with a pattern which is identical to that in the mask. On the other hand, if the photoresist was negative, one ends up with a pattern which is the negative of the one defined in the mask. Now, this is an integrated circuit. We have a, a two-dimensional pattern. To address the problem of the third dimension, two processes have been devised, namely surface micromachining and bulk micromachining. In this chart, I am showing a sketch for the surface micromachining process. In surface micromachining, the wafer has thin film materials selectively added to and removed from it. The film materials that are eventually removed are called sacrificial materials, whereas those that remain are called structural materials. For example, a cantilever beam may be created on a silicon wafer by depositing silicon dioxide as a sacrificial layer, depositing polysilicon as a structural layer, patterning the beam on the polysilicon, and then <clears throat> dissolving the sacrificial layer. In bulk micromachining, mechanical structures are created within the confines of the silicon wafer by selectively removing wafer material by wet and dry etching techniques. The anisotropic etching rates of the different crystal planes of the wafer are exploited. For example, to form a suspended metal insulator metal capacitor, windows are opened on the surface by etching with <coughs> KOH to eat away the substrate underneath the device. So this is a, an example of how bulk micromachining may be utilized to make a metal insulator metal capacitor where the parasitics that would be would have been introduced by the substrate are eliminated. Some of the fundamental nanomemes device physics and their application are given next. Nanomems may be utilized to exploit a multitude of phenomena, the physical phenomena, such as acoustical, electrical, optical, mechanical, magnetic, fluidic, quantum effects, and mixed domain. Therefore, the universe of possible implementations is vast and only limited by our imagination. Possible areas of endeavor already under research include nanoelectronics, micro nanomechanics, <coughs> excuse me, nanoengineering, nanobiotechnology, nanomedicine, RFMEMS, and IoT. The most fundamental element in which one can base an electrostatically actuated device is the parallel plate capacitor. This consists of a fixed and a movable metal plate separated at distance D by a medium of the electric constant epsilon. Assuming that the area of the plates is much greater than the separation between them, the capacitance is given by the equation C equals epsilon A over D, and corresponding to an applied voltage V, there exists a potential energy between the plates given by one half C V squared or epsilon A V squared over 2D. 
this energy stored between the plates or the gradient of this energy stored between the plates gives the force F, <clears throat> which is the force necessary to avoid the plates from collapsing one onto the other. The force is given by epsilon a v squared over 2d squared. And if we fix the plate at one end so that we have an anchored top plate, the application of the voltage would result in the deflection of the top plate as shown. <clears throat> a typical application of MEMS capacitors is shown here in the compensation of the detuning of an antenna due to its proximity to the human body. The issue is that objects in the near field of the antenna produce a reduction in the resonance frequency and therefore detune the antenna. When the antenna is detuned, that means that the, <coughs> the impedance match between the power amplifier and the, and the antenna deteriorates and the efficiency is, the power efficiency is reduced the power that is radiated is reduced. One way to combat this situation is to introduce a series RLC to compensate the reactive part of the antenna impedance. What we have here is that if U represents uh, <clears throat> by zeroing in the current into the RLC, into the series RLC, so that its imaginary part is zero, we can. tune the impedance of the network so that it matches the antenna impedance. Therefore, we can improve the match, which for example, if it starts at an extreme detuned state, by varying this capacitance bank in the RLC, we can adjust the real and imaginary parts of the input impedance until a match condition is obtained. <clears throat> the next actuation mechanism to be dealt with is the piezoelectric mechanism. In this mechanism, a force F produces a voltage proportional to, to the force, which is given by the expression V equals D times D zero over epsilon, epsilon zero, A times F. Where D is a piezoelectric constant, a, two, a, a tensor of second rank. This mechanism provides a large force, but small displacement. And typical materials exhibiting piezoelectricity include aluminum nitride, zinc oxide, lead zirconate titanate, polyvinyl, uh, polyvinyl fluoride and quartz. 
for applications requiring resonators at frequency of several gigahertz, the film bulk acoustic wave resonator is employed. The FBAR is essentially an acoustic cavity. It consists of a piezoelectric material, aluminum nitride in this case, which is sandwiched between two electrodes, where the electrodes act as an acoustic, as acoustic impedance discontinuities. In the FBAR, excitation of the acoustic wave occurs upon application of an AC voltage across the capacitor, which causes the, piezo the, causes the piezoelectric material to expand and contract, thus eliciting electrical oscillations between mechanical and electrical field domains. This oscillation <clears throat> may be represented or modeled by this circuit. G shunt shows or represents the shunt capacitance between the plates. C sub P, the parallel plate capacitance. L sub M, C sub M, R, R sub M, the resonance of the piezoelectric material. An application of these F bars is in the area of filters. If we utilize the ladder network architecture or topology, we find that the series resonance of the resonator in the series branch <clears throat> sets the center frequency the parallel resonance of the resonator in the series branch sets the upper skirt of the filter and the series resonance of the short of the shunt resonator sets the lower skirt of the filter and this shows an example of a filter realized using this F-bar technology. Compared to the surface acoustic wave uh, established filter technology, we find that the insertion loss and the ripple that may be attained are less. Now the principles of nanoscale devices <clears throat> are based on the physics of this dimensional regime. <clears throat> In particular, as the device size is reduced, the electron behavior stops obeying classical physics in which its momentum and energy are continuous and start obeying quantum mechanics in which they behave as waves with quantized energy. Then, depending on the particular device structure, behaviors such as interference, diffraction, etc., that are characteristic of waves or Coulomb interaction characteristic which pertain to particles may be prominent in the device. <clears throat> At submicron dimensions, the phenomenon of uh, Casimir forces is found. The way to explain, or one way to explain these Casimir forces 
is that if you have, for example, two parallel plates, there is a difference in the density of states in the electromagnetic field outside of the plates as compared to inside or between the plates. And this is responsible for a force of attraction between the plates. This force is called the Casimir force. And it's given by this expression, minus pi squared h bar c over 240 times one over z to the fourth power. So if we have, for example, two metal structures, which are separated, let's say, let's say two parallel plates of area one square centimeter, which are separated by half a micron, they will experience a force of attraction of two microns, of two micronewtons. The Casimir force which is most noticeable at so micron distances can affect nano electromechanical systems. The impact of Casimir force in MEMS was shown by Chan and company in 2001. They fabricated a device consisting of a polysilicon plate suspended by a torsional rod, only a few micrometers in diameter. And they noticed that when they approached a metallized sphere to the plate, the Casimir force between the sphere and the plate causes the plate to rotate around the rod. In figure B, I show a scanning electron micrograph of the device that they fabricated. And on the right-hand side, I am showing the, the experimental setup. They had a, a plate suspended by a, a torsional rod, which had some electrodes underneath. And they use a piezoelectric effect to control the distance between the sphere, the metallic sphere, and the torsional plate. The calculation or the measurement of the force between the the displacement between the sphere and the torsional plate as a function of the applied voltage is given in these graphs here. Capasso, the senior researcher, found that there was a, a noticeable difference between the electrostatic force and the Casimir force. So this is one of the most recent and definitive demonstrations of the impact of Casimir force in MEM structures. Now, a negative consequence of the Casimir force is that it may limit the density or the number of devices per unit in volume that one can achieve, that is the, the maximum density of MEMS devices that one can achieve, or it may adversely impact the operation of MEMS devices. In this example, I show a bar actor. 
which works as follows. You apply a voltage between the top plate and the bottom plate and a dielectric that is partially into the gap between the plates will experience a force into the plate. So since you are introducing a dielectric with, between the plates, that would change the capacitance of the plates of, the, of this structure. So it would behave as a varactor. Now, ideally, the change in capacitance of this varactor should have been 47%. But in practice, it was found that it was only 15%. So the tuning range was ideally 47%, but ideally, but in practice it was 15%. An examination of the forces in the varactor, namely the Casimir force and the electrostatic force, found that due to the asymmetry, the Casimir force was greater than the electrostatic force, much, much greater than the electrostatic force. As a result, as the dielectric began intruding into the gap, it was deflected towards one end, but it would get stuck. And that what could, it was the, uh, the reason for the reduction in tuning range. Now, this phenomenon of, of the dielectric being pulled towards one of the plates is an example of quantum mechanical pulling. So what that means is you can have a structure and there will be an interplay between the Casimir forces and the electrostatic forces. And when the distance is, when the Casimir force overcomes the electrostatic force, something like a pulling effect where the intruding part or moving part will snap. And in this case, get stuck on the top plate. Next, I will present a couple of examples of how nanomems enables the Internet of Things. I address first the issue of low power consumption radios. In this application, the Casimir effect is exploited in a positive way. That is, it is exploited to create or to enable a low driving power frequency multiplier. This figure here shows a, a block diagram of a basic receiver function. In a communications receiver, you receive an input signal at in, you apply it to a down converter, and you get an output signal f out. So the frequency of the output signal is a thin minus F LO, or the frequency of the local oscillator. The local oscillator frequency is generated by a local oscillator chain. And this local oscillator or LO chain consists of, a, of an oscillator here, typically a crystal oscillator with frequencies of the order of 100 megahertz or less, followed by a frequency multiplier, amplifier, bandpass filter, another frequency multiplier, another bandpass, an amplifier, and another bandpass filter to end up with a frequency of the order of gigahertz.
<clears throat> one device that may be used to efficiently create this frequency multiplier is a so-called micromechanical tunneling transistor. This device looks like a FET. We have a source and a drain, except that the current between the source and drain is regulated by a voltage that controls the displacement of this beam. From a position of equilibrium, and in doing so, this gap, W, will experience the flow of a tunneling current between the tip of the beam and the drain. So the operation is as follows. A pre-pulling voltage is applied between the gate and the beam. And this voltage affects a fine tunneling tip displacement, delta Z, between the tip of the beam and the drain contact. This is rise to currents of the order of nanometer of uh, nano amps. Now, in operation, uh, the low gate to beam voltage is necessary to prevent electrical break breakdown between the gate and the cantilever beam, as well as to avoid the damage of the tunneling junction. The physics of the device are as follows. The position of the beam is a function of the equilibrium between the upward spring or hook's force and the downward electrostatic and Casimir forces. These forces are given by this expression. The spring force is the spring constant times the displacement, the electrostatic force, epsilon av squared over two times c zero minus delta z squared, and the Casimir force, a constant kc over c zero minus delta z to the fourth power. The current between the beam and the contact obeys a quantum mechanical tunneling effect in which electrons from the beam tip traverse a potential barrier of height pi and width w, which depends on the distance between the beam and the contact. This is characterized by this expression. Tunneling current equals the drain source voltage times a constant times e to the minus 1.025 square root of the barrier height times the distance traveled. Now the various forces vary with displacement in this fashion. And the displacement pertaining to each voltage is obtained at the as the root square at every voltage. It is seen that the Casimir force dominates the electrostatic force after a displacement of about 0 0.13, three, two or three microns. And that the applied voltage is less at this point is here less than two and a half volts. The MMT obeys a model where there is a variable capacitor, C sub G, that controls the gate current. This C sub G is epsilon zero A 
over z0 minus delta z of v and the tunneling current modeled by this, uh, by this expression. The circuit may be modeled, may be simulated in spice and gives rise to a voltage waveform with acute or narrow peaks. The application of a, an input sign, a signal provides an output signal with many such narrow peaks. The spectrum of these peaks is rich in harmonics, needing for the two harmonics for the amplitude to reach 10%. This multiplier, therefore, has the potential for applications in low power receivers that are radiation tolerant. So, frequency multipliers that may be used in satellites or the like. The next enabler or the next, the next example in which NanoMEMS enables IoT is an energy harvester. The motivation for this device is energy autonomy. We know that wireless sensor nodes are isolated and remote. Therefore, they need to operate with limited battery power or capture or harvest energy from the environment. Approaches to energy harvesting include capturing radio signals from the environment, such as TV stations, cell phone based stations, or DC power uh, for conversion to DC power, converting solar energy into DC power, or converting environmental mechanical vibrations into the energy through the piezoelectric effect. And this is the application that we will re review. The device in question is shown in this figure. Hello, doctor. Yes. Uh, sorry for interrupt. Uh, audience, can you please turn off your mic? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, the example I, I will present for energy harvesting is the Togo MEMS based design concept. It basically has a, a, a beam or a membrane that is anchored at four points in which a piezoelectric material, namely aluminum nitride has been deposited. The beam is loaded with, by proof mass, proof masses at the extremes like here and here, so that when the beam is subjected to vibrations, it will move up and down. The vibrations will create an in-plane strain in the thin region here, and via the piezoelectric effect, voltages may be read out of these terminals. Here, one, two, three, four. And this is shown better in this top view where we have the proof masses here and here the beam, the electrodes coincided with the coincided with the anchors. So as the as the beam vibrates up and down, the voltage generated is captured by these electrodes.
this chart shows an example of the measured performance of this energy harvester where on the acceleration of one and a half meters per square centimeter uh, per square second the power measured at the output of the electrodes here varies from like 0.1 nanowatt at a frequency of 1575 hertz to 10 nanowatts at a frequency of around 1588 hertz. So in conclusion, the NMEMS offers excellent potential to open many new opportunities for turning nanoscale physics or phenomena into novel and or superior devices and applications. And nanomames can enable the Internet of Things in a number of areas. We have only shown two, namely for energy harvesting from vibrations that help power remote sensors and actuators and by low power consumption electronics to enable wireless nodes. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you for the thank you for your interesting presentation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the Q and A session. You may write down your question in the meeting chat or unmute uh, unmute your microphone to ask the question. Okay. Before that, doctor, uh, there's a there's an audience uh request the slide. Hello, doctor. <clears throat> okay, uh, I saw the first question. So the first question is, uh, why is a community so important towards the development of IoT? Okay, Hello, doctor. Repeat, please. Yeah. Why is... Uh, why is a community... Uh, why is a community so important to the towards the development of IoT? Oh, like a like a community of people. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So the the Internet of Things is by nature interdisciplinary. So you have device people, fabrication people, circuits people systems people so it is necessary to bring to fruition any application to involve all of these disciplines because no one person has all the expertise is that does that answer your question Um, all right. Yes, I think I think community is so important because of the all the disciplines, all the behavior, right? Correct. Okay. So now we move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, this question is from Chang Yong. Do you think Malaysia successfully applied IoT in smart city development, and why? Well, I'm not familiar with the, the the developments, the academic developments there. But you know, in principle, for example, the 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 last example that I showed on the energy harvester that does not require fabrication equipment that is too expensive. 
So that means that it should be within the reach of any uh, any any developing country. So in that sense, Malaysia should also be able to exploit the opportunities brought by IoT applications. Does that answer the All question? Right. I see, yes. Okay. Mm, so the third question is from Chi Yik Hui. Uh, what are the challenges to the widespread of you uh, widespread use of IoT? For the challenges, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, I would say price, <laughs> because the the I mean one of the one of the main challenges is going to be price or cost because. As you saw, the number of the, the, the envisioned number of devices is huge. And that can only happen if the devices are made cost effectively. Uh, all other challenges would I would say would be in reducing the fabrication complexity, uh, improving management of the devices there are going to be so many so many devices and to be operated in, in concert and of course security that's one of the biggest issues because you know you don't you don't want intruders into your home if you have cameras or the like in your home, that could be hacked by, you know, so a, a criminal, a person with criminal intent. So you want to avoid that. So infrastructure to make things inexpensively is, system know-how to be able to manage all of those devices and security to ensure that there are no intrusions into your privacy. Does that answer the question? Yes. <clears throat> oh, all right. Uh, so there's a there's an audience uh, request this request the slide. Uh, doctor, would you mind uh, after this event, uh, can you share the slide to us? Yes, uh, I will. I will send them to you. All right. Okay. So move on to the next question. This is from uh, Muhammad Moas. Okay. Does IoT application have a drawback towards the nature? Towards nature? Uh, to the nature. I, I'm uh, not understanding uh, the last word. Uh, uh, Moaz, can you uh, just open your mic and um, answer it? Uh, I mean, uh, question it. Okay, can you write it in the, in the, in the chat? Oh, uh, yes. Never mind. You you are allowed to uh, open your mic and ask. Okay. Uh. Okay. Uh. The nature that I'm that. Uh. Yeah. Okay. The nature that I'm into is our is our surroundings like trees, our air, and will IoT application bring drawbacks to it that nature. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you very well. And can you write the question, please? In the chat? 
Um, doctor, let me come on behalf of um Mr. Mohammed uh -huh. Moss. I think he means like um, does IoT application have a drawback towards the surrounding? Means the mother earth, like the nature. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Those IoT applications have a drawback towards the environment. Ah. Uh, Well, if you remember the, the, the chart on Hewlett Packard's vision, they say that they can, that the, the, the vision of the whole earth can require like, a, like one trillion sensors, one trillion devices. If you have so many devices, <clears throat> you are going to have I mean, constant activity replacing devices, for example. Replacing devices that have failed and that could turn into garbage. So you have the example of the, of the plastic bottles that they are very nice to use for, for soda drinks and, and but, but after you finish, People throw them and they become garbage. And now they are creating a problem. So pollution because of, of the huge amount of, of, of devices, sensors and actuators connected to the IoT that will have to be constantly replaced. Is, is one potential drawback as well as uh, environmental in terms of wireless pollutions because you will have so many more wireless connections. Yes, the power of, each of these wireless connections will be low but there will be so many devices that then the total power will be large or maybe large. So that may be another issue like causing interference, unwanted interference from, from wireless connections. So I can, I can see at least those two things at the moment. Does that answer your question? Yes, doctor. Okay. Um, okay. So comes comes to the next question from Daniel. Uh, MIMS accelerometer have poor performance today. Why is that? What normal MIMS accelerometer can have better performance and why? <clears throat> Um, well, that's an interesting question. I, you know, obviously the, the fundamental issue is the, is the mechanism of operation, which is based on electrostatic In other words, you, you convert a mechanical motion into a force and that force into a voltage. So that, that mechanism has limitations. For example, I have developed or I have invented a new accelerometer capable of, of detecting Pico Gs in which the, the example that I showed on the micromechanical transistor, micromechanical tunneling transistor is utilized. So you have a, an array 
of turning tips. And if it, it happens that the, the sensitivity, when you suspend these tips on a mechanical suspension, the sensitivity of the current through the tips to the gap between the tip and the contact is much, much greater than what you can get from the sensitivity of the usual conversion of uh, force to electrostatic voltage. So, you know, the, the so I would say it is, a, it is a matter of finding ways, finding better ways to detect the acceleration. In the conventional electrostatic way of doing it, one cannot attain too high a sensitivity. But there are other ways, like using this tunneling current approach, in which you can. So I guess the, the bottom line of the answer to the question is that the limitations are rooted in the in the design techniques that are used. Maybe that's the most that you can get from that, from those designs. Does that answer your question? All right, I see. Yes. Mm, so Daniel, do you have any question? No, the, the answer was uh, well stated, and I'm looking forward to a product. Any any possibility that there might be such an accelerometer coming out soon based on the cantilever transistor? Well, I, I, I developed that concept for when I was consulting for a company, and it, was, it has been patented. In 2013, I think it's 2013, 2014, two patents came out of that. So I don't know what they did with it, but but certainly the the the, the pool in that in that case was from like for a military application where you had the detectors uh, placed in a certain region. And if if someone was even just walking, that would be detected. So it, it is possible that 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 uh, that product is is being developed or has been developed, but the there's no visibility <laughs> in in the in the in the consumer space. Yes, and the patent would block development of that product into the consumer space. As you mentioned earlier, cost in the IoT is extremely important. And without cheap accelerometers, inexpensive accelerometers like the one you showed, that cannot go into the IoT if it's expensive. Exactly. Thank you for your presentation, Doctor. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Uh, so this comes comes to the last question. Does IoT have relation with AI technology? If yes, how significant is the relation? Yes, I think it it does because again, you are going to be managing a huge network and I believe that will require AI techniques to, to reduce work. That is to, maybe AI techniques will enable the possibility of controlling those millions and millions and millions of devices without controlling 
each individual device. But by, by, by looking at the, the overall behavior, maybe one can control the individual behavior. And, and IoT would come, would come in handy in that situation. I mean, AI would come in handy in that situation. So, so does that answer the question? Yes. Okay, so yeah. I, I, one of the things, one of the important things of IoT is that it will, it will create a huge market and huge job opportunities for all kinds of disciplines. I see. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we have come to the end of presentation. We would like to say thank you to, the, to our presentation for today, Dr. Hector, for the interesting presentation, and also to all of the audience for your active participation. Hopefully, the presentation will be beneficial for everyone. All right. Before we end today's session, let, let us take a group photo. Don't mind if I can get everybody to turn on their camera to join this, uh, to come and join this photo session. Okay, is everyone ready? Let me go. Okay, so I will count on three, two, one, smile. Okay, uh, one more. Uh, you want to do freestyles again? Three, two, one. All right, okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome. Uh, finally, we are, the presentation has come to the end. So you are welcome to scan the QR code on the screen or access the feedback form through the link posted in the meeting chat for the e-certificate. Other than that, you can also kindly scan the QR code on the poster from the right to join our next event. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank Lastly, you so much, Doctor. thank you for your attention and we hope to see you again in our next event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Bye bye.
Small talk, no conversation That look makes me impatient I can't tell what you're thinking Please tell me what you're thinking Last night we were more than fine Just tell me if you changed your mind You changed your mind Tomorrow morning I'm calling, no answer Would you text me when you feel like right? When it feels right to you but I'm all, I'm all in, I'm falling past it. But if you're looking at me with the heart, oh. me right now, don't tell me that you need me, don't show up at my house. I'll call up in your feelings around me, round and round. Don't build me up just to let me down. Just to let me down, 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 hey, down. Just with my head, don't tell me to fall. Live with your feet still on the edge. I'm all out of breath, baby. Don't run me round and round. Don't kiss me, no, don't kiss me right now. On your lips, just need it. If you don't mean it. You know you got me in the palm of your head But I love those hands Oh, yeah You only let me hold you when you can I don't understand Cause I'm all, I'm all in We're calling, no answer But you text me when you feel like When it feels right to you all right to all the audience thank you everyone for joining we are closing the meeting now thank you